Today is Easter Sunday, and today we get to celebrate uh, the fact that uh, not only did Jesus Christ, our Savior, live a perfect life and go to the cross to die for yours and my sin, past, present, and future, so that we could experience the forgiveness of sin and that cleansing that comes from our faith and our trust in Him. But Jesus didn't just do that. If He had done that, and that was the end of the story, then He would have been in a long list of uh, other martyrs and really good people who maybe have uh, done, you know, significant acts or big sacrifices for people. But the cool thing about the Christian faith is that for us, we believe the, the eyewitness accounts of people who were there with Jesus who saw that he rose from the dead. That uh, on, early on that Sunday morning, uh, the women came to uh, finish up the embalming process and they, they arrived there and the tomb was empty, and, which is a pretty significant thing. In, in the story of Jesus. And so then they were puzzled, but they went back and told the other disciples. They rushed and they saw, and sure enough, the tomb was empty. And so then periodically over a number of days, uh, Jesus appeared to his disciples in different settings and things and really freaked him out, which was really awesome. Such a, such a cool thing for Jesus to do. But today we get to remember that, that first day, but today in this time that we have together where we're going to open the Bible and read from it, uh, we're going to read an account that happened actually some days after the initial, the, the resurrection, even though that's kind of the impetus for everything we're going to talk about. So the title for today's message is New Life. Uh, our main passage is going to be John 21, verses 1 through 22. And the big idea that we're going to be exploring together today is that no one is too far gone to be redeemed and restored to new life. No one is too far gone. You're not too far gone. I'm not too far gone. As long as we have breath in our life, in our bodies, we have an opportunity to respond to the Lord's invitation for new life. Amen? And so that's our big idea, and we're going to explore that more together. Now, to give some context for our passage today, because uh, this is outside of our normal uh, series of events that we've been going through, so we're actually at a moment where, um, uh, where Jesus has uh, gone to the cross, and he's He's dead and he's risen again, and, and now we're, we're some time later. But just a week or two before that point, uh, last week we celebrated Palm Sunday and remembering when Jesus rode into Jerusalem uh, and started a whole chain of events that led to his crucifixion. And in and amongst that time, there was a moment where one of Jesus' top three disciples in like the inner circle, the core team, uh, Jesus was sharing with all of the disciples things that were going to happen, and his, his, one of his main guys, Peter, said, no, this is not going to happen over my dead body. They're not going to get you. <laughs> I, I will go to the death to make sure that, they, that you're fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Peter's not actually Satan, but like, but he's saying, you don't have the mind of God in this. But then in and amongst that discussion, uh, there's this moment where, uh, where Peter makes this blanket statement and he says, even if everybody leaves you, I'm not going to leave you. Even if everybody denies you, I'm not going to deny you. And Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And Peter said, no, couldn't be. Well, so then we see uh, within the gospel accounts where 
things unfold, and there's a moment where Jesus is uh, being interrogated by the high priests and different uh, religious rulers, and Peter is kind of standing aloof, and he's kind of warming himself by the fire, and sure enough, there's these moments where people are identifying Peter because they've seen him with Jesus or they recognize, hey, this guy isn't from around here. Hey, have you been with Jesus? And he denies Jesus. And sure enough, just like Jesus said, he denied him three times and then the rooster crowed and then Peter went off and just was a wreck because he was so devoted to Jesus and following Jesus but he let Jesus down in Jesus' greatest moment of need. Not the time to make a mistake. <laughs> and yet he did. And if you and I were in Peter's shoes, I'm, I'm sure we would try to say, oh, pff, surely not me. I would, I, would, I would succeed where Peter failed. I don't think so. I think for all of us, we'd probably be scared out of our wits and different things. <clears throat> so today, why I'm bringing all this up is because sometimes on Easter Sunday, there are some of you that I don't have the pleasure of just getting to sit down and chat with all the time. And sometimes there are things that I would really like to say that I think are the most important things um, that I wish I could communicate to people uh, if only... I was around them and able to be where the people are uh, and whatnot and, and be with y'all. And so today I want to communicate this. I want to share this passage because I think, I don't think I'm alone in this where there are moments in our life where we feel like we have let the Lord down. Like maybe we feel like maybe we've gone too far. Like maybe... We've gone down this road that is somehow a departure from following Jesus, and we've gone too far like we can't come back. And maybe we might feel a little ounce of what Peter felt when suddenly, here's Jesus risen from the dead, but Peter knows what he did. And Peter knows that Jesus knows what he did, because Jesus told him that he was going to do that, and it's this great wonderful convergence of events. But it was rough for Peter. And so how does Peter, how does Jesus deal with Peter? That's a big question that I have for us today. Because I would argue for, in defense of both Jesus and Peter and, and this moment that we see between them, that Jesus' heart for Peter is that Peter would know that, Peter, you're not too far gone to be redeemed and restored to this new life. And friends, I believe that you, wherever you're at today in your walk with the Lord, whether you're walking towards him or away from him or walking with him, or he, you're not even on the same map, you're not too far gone to be brought back together and redeemed and restored in your life. You're not too far gone. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to John chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. So this is after the resurrection. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet, the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the other right side of the boat, and you will find some. 
So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish, fish laid on it, out on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had revealed, was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And we'll stop there. There's a lot that we could unpack in this passage. I don't want to take a ton of time to do all of that. Uh, just a, a quick context note because it came up over and over again. You would think, didn't Jesus love all the disciples? And there was that phrase, the one that Jesus loved. That was John, the one who wrote all this down. That was his, his personal head nod of referencing himself. I don't know if he had a big ego or not of just like, Jesus loves me. <laughs> I'm the one Jesus loves, which I'm sure went over great in the campfires with the disciples. Um, but so... Uh, that's one of the disciples who's present with them, uh, John. <clears throat> and then you have the others, including Peter. And so the first thing I see in sort of Peter's journey and Peter's, this moment where Jesus meets Peter and, and is restoring Peter and that kind of thing, I see Peter mistaking resignation for recreation and that it will keep us empty and broken. And what I mean by that is that Peter, at this point, th this is the third time. So there's already been two moments where Jesus has revealed himself to the disciples, and somehow, in all the interactions, they never quite got the moment to clear the air. And like so many of us, Peter's default was, 
Well, I'm a fisherman. I thought that this was going to be my life, being Jesus' disciple, and things didn't really turn out the way I thought they were going to be, so I'm going to go fishing. And for you and I, maybe if we were in his shoes, maybe this is the moment where Peter is claiming the recreation card of like, I'm just going to go fishing. I don't know what else to do, but I'll go fishing. All the while, it, it looks like a good thing, like busy yourself because you don't know what to do and maybe just like put your hands to good work and that kind of thing. But there's a twinge in just the tone of the passage where this is not what Peter should be doing right now. As kind of the leader of this, this posse, this group of disciples, and as kind of one of the top three who's there, this isn't like he's not rallying them. He's, he's just wrapped up in his shame and his brokenness because he denied Jesus. And so when we read the passage, you know, we, we read the, the phrase, I'm going fishing. And all the fishermen said, hallelujah. Uh, and everybody else said, who, not me. <laughs> but we could end up mistaking this moment for a good thing when really I don't think it is for Peter because all it is doing for Peter is it's just keeping him unresolved and empty and broken. And did you notice that in verse 3 that they go out fishing? So Peter says, I'm going. All the, three, all the rest of them say, okay, we'll go with you. And they don't catch anything. Not a good night. And so they're, they're there empty. And he's feeling all this brokenness and shame. Not a good night for Peter. If I were a fisherman by trade, I would just be fit to be tied. I would, <laughs> it would be a rough night for me. Now, I mention this because for you and I, and as, as I read the story now, obviously we're not in the same position as Peter. We did not literally physically camp with, eat with, travel with, minister with Jesus like Peter did. We did not face the exact same opportunity to fail, to deny him in the way that Jesus did in the setting that he did. But friends, you and I have an opportunity each and every day when we're faced with all kinds of trials and temptations and all kinds of things to either accept and affirm our faith in Christ and our connection to Jesus or not. And that by our actions, by the way we live our life, that maybe there are there are moments where we deny Jesus and then there's this strain in our relationship between us and him. And so, we could, maybe for good practice, we could uh, put our hands to good use and do some recreational activities like going fishing or going for a walk or a jog or whatever you like to do, or hiking. Hiking is a good thing. Maybe you like to just sit and, and, and drink coffee. Praise the Lord. Um, you know, that's a good recreation for me. Um, but I say all that because we could try that, but we're really just avoiding the inevitable of needing to face up to, I blew it. Maybe you're here today and, and that's kind of been your story. Or maybe that's been, maybe not today, but that's been different moments in your life where there's even still some stuff that's unresolved between you and the Lord, I would encourage you to take care of it today. Even while we're talking, that you can just bow your head and you can pray to the Lord yourself and just confess to him and admit to him, Lord, I blew it here. I, I, I don't want this unresolved thing between me and you. I don't want this brokenness between me and you anymore. I want the fullness that you have for me because of relationship with you, and I'm not feeling that right now. Not that my feelings are everything, but that, like, I'm, there's this strain here. And I just want to encourage you that no one is too far gone to be redeemed and restored to new life. And that includes you and me today in our walk with the Lord, that 
We need to be, we need to make an honest assessment of where we are and not just mistake our, our resignation for recreation like Peter seems to do. All right, you can go to the next slide. So the next thing I see in our passage is responding with abandon when we hear that the Lord is near. So Peter, although he's, he's broken and he's empty and he hasn't caught much all night, there's this moment where Jesus, he's playing coy with the disciples again. He's done this thing before. This is, this is a, an echo of something that happened earlier in Jesus' ministry. Calls out to the disciples who have been fishing all night. They haven't caught anything. And like they haven't put their net on the other side before. Uh, but Jesus, in that moment, he says, why don't you try this side? And so they go ahead and they try that side. And lo and behold, they get this huge catch of fish, so, so much so that the boat begins to sink and it's this whole scene. And so John is the one who first recognizes it. John calls it out. He says, it's the Lord. And Peter finally wakes up out of his stupor of shame and all of it, he wakes up and it's like, it's the Lord. I'm going. <laughs> I'm going to go and be where Jesus is. And his response is abandoned. It's not quite the same reckless abandon that we see Peter do at other times in the Gospels, because did you catch it? That So Simon, he's been doing the whole fisherman thing. He's been working. So as fishermen did apparently back then, they, they stripped off their, their outer garments, and so he didn't have his cloak on or anything. And there's this weird moment where he sees that it's the Lord, and he decides he's going to jump out of the boat, and then he puts on this outer garment. Not to criticize Peter, but I would think that if there was, some, if there was nothing between Peter and the Lord, Peter wouldn't have cared if his outer garment was on. He just would have beat feet to get to where Jesus was. But Peter still had that bit of shame, I imagine. And so the way I interpret it, the way I read it, and you can have a different, and uh, this part is for free. This is just my opinion. But when I read that he put on his outer garment, I imagine Peter's feeling still that bit of shame, even though his heart is like, I want to be where Jesus is. And that Jesus, I know that Jesus is the one who can really take care of this stuff that's inside of me. I know that, so I'm going to go and be where Jesus is. And so for Peter, we see him responding with that abandon because he heard that God was near. He heard Jesus was there, so he went and he went to where Jesus was. How many of us are hungry for that type of an experience where maybe God seems so far away? Like, not only have I blown it, but also God doesn't feel so close. And we're just waiting for this moment where maybe we might hear that God is over here or maybe God is doing this thing or maybe I can go to this place or I can read this thing or whatever to be somehow more connected with the Lord. Are we responding like Peter? Where even though Peter still had that shame, and I would submit that that might be why he put on that outer garment. Otherwise, I don't think he would have cared. But even though he had that, he still went to Jesus. Do we still go to Jesus even though we have our shame and even though we have all our, our stuff that we're carrying. I don't know. I can tell you, like, just full confessional in my life that there have been those moments where even though I have all this stuff that I'm carrying, that I'd like to think there are moments when I go and I just, I forget convention in my head and I just think, I just need to be with the Lord. And so I'm going to go be with Him. Maybe you have or haven't had that experience, and I would encourage you that whatever you're walking through, that Jesus just wants to be with you. That's why he went to the cross to pay for your sins, so that we could have that reconciliation with him. 
That's why he rose again from the dead to conquer sin and death so that there would be nothing between us and him anymore and we could really be reconciled to him. No one is too far gone to be redeemed and restored to new life, and that's you and me and Peter. The third thing I see is that repairing communion with the Lord will take place through participation. Did you catch this as we were reading through on, on the first time through? So they, Peter, he jumps out of the boat. He, he swims to shore. He's with Jesus. He shows up, and Jesus has everything ready. He's got fish. He's got bread. The fire is going. It's down to charcoals, y'all. It has been, the fire's been going for a while. Somehow the disciples weren't paying attention to this, that there's somebody seeming to have a good fish fry going on on the beach while they're out working their butts off. However, Jesus has it all laid out. Jesus doesn't need their fish. And yet, when they come on, on to the shore, Jesus says, he commands them, he gives them that instruction, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. And so Simon Peter, he went aboard, he hauled that, that big bag of fish or that big net of fish all to the shore. 153 of them, net wasn't torn. And then Jesus invites them to have breakfast. What this tells me, what this speaks to me, and I had the hardest time figuring out how to summarize this, this, this phrase and this statement because we are saved by grace through faith. And yet, what we see in the life of Peter is that although Peter's participation in that whole process of uh, the common meal together that they were going to share, Jesus still wanted him to go and get that fish and to bring the fish that he just caught to get to taste some of that, that favor that they just experienced through that miracle of catching all that fish. And this is a moment that begins that process of repairing the communion between Jesus and Peter. And it started, yes, with the invitation, Jesus invited them, hey, come have breakfast, Bring that fish while you're at it. But then it really, it took place. It, we don't have this in the text, and thank goodness we don't, but we don't have Peter saying, no, I don't need to bring my fish. <laughs> or we don't have him rejecting that or somehow rejecting what Jesus said or disobeying. We don't have him doing that. He went ahead and he practiced obedience and he did what Jesus said to do even though Jesus had it all done anyway. For you and I, for a lot of us, we need all the help we can get, amen? Where, goodness, if it were up to me, we wouldn't have very many fish to bring to the fish fry. <laughs> uh, lots of reasons for that, but that would be me. I'm not, granted, I'm not Peter, and maybe you're not either, however... Uh, my point is this, is that if it were up to me for that particular meal, I don't know that I could bring anything that would even compare to what Jesus caught in that middle of the night and offered and, and that, that piece of bread. And yet Jesus is inviting them to participate by providing what he has provided to the meal. So for you, if you feel that break in communion between you and the Lord... I believe that the repair takes place as we participate in relationship with him, which means when he speaks, we respond. Whether that's through our action, like Peter, where we don't see Peter saying, okay, Jesus, got it. Yep, I'm going over here. We just see that Peter does what Jesus says to do. Not only that, but when Jesus says to do something and he responds with an action, and if we respond with an action, sometimes we can respond with 
a word and start the dialogue and the conversation back and forth to start repairing the conversation, or sorry, the, the, the relationship, which is what we'll get to in just a moment. <coughs> Peter participated by bringing his fish. What do you bring? Because no one is too far gone to be redeemed and restored to new life. And Jesus wants you to participate. He wants you to, to win in that activity of being restored and being repaired in that relationship. What do you bring? You can go to the next slide. And so then, in, within the conversation, we see that love covers our failure and invites us to begin again. Love covers our failure and invites us to begin again. So then, in, starting in verse 15, breakfast is done. Jesus and Peter, they start talking. And so Peter, Jesus asks Peter the question, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. Now, what's interesting in the Greek is that in Greek, there are four words for our one word of love. <laughs> it's fun that way. Um, and so there's two words being used right here. There's one, which is uh, the word agape, which is unconditional, uh, often sacrificial type love that is being done. It's more of a service or a duty kind of thing, but it's uh, something that's done out of love and is that way. And then there's the word uh, phileo, which is that brotherly love, that sort of uh, brotherly affection or familial affection that people can have towards one another, where it's like, maybe I'm not literally blood related to you, but man, it's like we're brothers. Now, what's fascinating here is that Jesus starts by saying, Peter, or Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Do you unconditionally love me? Are you, are, is your love that action of duty? And so then Peter replies, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. And so then Jesus says, okay, feed my lambs. Then Jesus says the second time, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? And then Peter replies, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you, that brotherly affection, that kind of thing. Then Jesus says, tend my sheep. Now, catch this. This is a really cool part. Are you ready? I don't think you're ready. Wait for it. Okay. So then, the third time, third time, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? And then Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you phileo me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I phileo you. Now, in the dictionaries, in the, the fancy Bible dictionaries that you can spend lots of money on and they tell you lots of really cool things, uh, they will admit and just be very clear that between agape and phileo, especially in a, a passage like this, there's virtually no distinction between the two. However, in the nature of those words themselves and just the uniqueness that makes those words what they are, we gain a little bit of insight into this passage where, where Peter was when Jesus starts the conversation is just on action and duty. But Peter keeps responding with, Lord, you are my most cherished. You are, I love you so deeply like you're a brother to me. That's the nature of this, I love you, Lord, that he's telling Jesus. And then the third time, Jesus switches gears. And with each of these moments where he asks the question, Peter responds, he gives him an action to do. We're not going to talk about that today. That's a sermon for another time. However, when Jesus asks that third time, he shifts, and it really gets to the heart of the question, where Peter this whole time has been saying, yes, Lord, I love you. I love you like a brother. I have this, you're out of this world for me. I love you so much. And then Jesus simply asks that third time, do you love me like that? And where that cuts to the heart for Peter is that 
Peter had denied Jesus three times. And each of those times where uh, Peter was asked, do you know this man? Surely you're connected with Jesus. Peter said, nope, not me. You got the wrong guy. And by the third time that somebody asked him, he starts swearing up a storm and making a fool of himself in front of everybody. And then the rooster crowed that third time. But I, I imagine that by that third time that Jesus asked the question, that maybe Peter picked up on it, oh, not only did I just royally mess up, but I wasn't actually acting like I loved you. I didn't confirm my affection with action in that place. And so, for Jesus, I believe through all of this, this is one of the most loving ways that Jesus has to restore Peter. Just by, not by dragging, like rubbing his nose in it, not by like saying, Peter, how could you? Of all my disciples, you're the one. You even said you'd go to all these great lengths. You even cut a guy's ear off for my sake. What gives, bud? He doesn't rebuke him like that. He just asked the question, do you love me? And I think that for you and I today, as we read a passage like this, we are equally asked the question, do you love Jesus? Is it just, and it's not, I shouldn't say just, but it, it's not simply the unconditional, sacrificial love that the action is more done out of duty and responsibility in that way. Even if we start there, it's not just that. Do we really treasure the Lord? Do in our heart, even though we may mess up a million times in a day, in our heart, do we love the Lord, yes or no? And I think that each one of us are asked that question, just like Peter. And so I believe that Jesus' love, because of everything he did on the cross and because of the resurrection, the empty tomb that we see, that his love covers up our failure and invites us to begin again because by the end of these two paragraphs here, Jesus issues the command just like at the beginning. He doesn't say, well, Peter, you got a whole big mess to clean up. That's not what he says. He just says, follow me. And then Peter gets hung up on comparison. Well, what about this guy? <laughs> and then and Jesus addresses it, but then he makes the strong point to say, forget him. If it, it's my business what happens to him, you follow me. Isn't that amazing? Love covers our failure and invites us to begin again. You can go to the next slide. Because no one is too far gone to be redeemed and restored to new life because of Jesus Christ. Because he's the one who does the redeeming. He's the one who does the restoration. Even when we have royally messed it up and we are just in a mess, whether it's internally or externally or anything in between, when we make a mess of it, Jesus is able to redeem that mess. He's able to restore us back to where we're supposed to be, walking with him in new life. And so for you and I today, that's the invitation. That's the invitation, I believe, of this resurrection day where we get to celebrate the new life that we have in Jesus is that no matter what you've done or where you've been, you can start fresh today. It makes me think of how, I'm sure you've experienced this in a workplace, but where there's a, uh, like the accident counter in like days since our last accident, right? And so it's really great when you rack up like the, the 300 days, 500 days, 600 days. And then that one person slips on that one spill. <laughs> uh, and then, 
you have to erase that, and now you're starting back at zero. Here's my point, is that even if you have gone a great stretch and then you really messed it up, you relapsed, you whatever, you can still start the counter back at zero and God's grace is there for you so that you can walk in this new life that Jesus has for you. And so as the worship team comes up, we're going to sing a song. Uh, a lot of it is a familiar song, and so if there's parts that you don't know, don't worry about it. Uh, just let the words kind of be like a prayer for you. Um, but I just want you to consider for you and kind of take an inventory for yourself. Where are you in relation to the Lord? Are you lockstep with Him or have you kind of gone your own way? Because the truth is, is that no one is too far gone. You have an opportunity to make it right with the Lord and to, to start talking to Him, to bring it up with Him, to admit the, the way that you're wrong, admit th that, Lord, I'm helpless to this. I need your help. And I believe that the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to help you get back up again so you can keep walking with him.